have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, as always, your TV Guidance Counselor, and I'm very excited about our episode this week. This is a live edition of the show that we recorded last Saturday at the Eugene Merman Comedy Festival. If this is your first time checking out the show and you're joining us because of my great guest this week, welcome. A little bit about me and the show. I am a stand-up comedian. I am based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and I've been doing the show for about a year and a half. The premise of the show, I'm a huge TV fan, is I own every edition of TV Guide. Yes, I will admit that publicly. And what someone does is they pick an edition of TV Guide from my collection, they sit down, they look through it, they write down what they would watch that week in television, and then the podcast is us discussing their choices. And that is exactly what we did last Saturday with my guest Eugene Merman himself and Mr. John Glazer, two guys whose comedy I really, really love. This was a great time, and I, uh, I want to thank Eugene for having me on the festival. Eugene's been incredibly supportive of my comedy over the years. Uh, he's had me on almost all of his festivals and I can't thank him enough and also Julie Smith the producer of the festival it was really great of her uh, to have me down there and John who's one of those guys that just makes me laugh so much uh, when you see so much comedy doing stand up you kind of get a little jaded and John is one of those guys that I literally never have not laughed uh, watching him and so we did it we sat down at the Brattle Theater which I want to thank them as well for for having the show there the Brattle is kind of our Alamo draft house or cine family in Cambridge Massachusetts I've been going there for probably 20 plus years since I was 12 or 13 I saw so many great amazing midnight movies there and horror movies and it was really really cool to get to perform on their stage so that was kind of a big deal for me. Uh, so this is a great episode. We talk about TV in 1983, the week of April 30th. I think you'll really enjoy it, and then you'll check out some other episodes of the show. There are plenty to choose from, and there'll be more to come. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor live from the Eugene Merman Comedy Festival with my guests, John Glazer and Eugene Merman. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for Hello. for being here and, and traveling back to the week of, uh, we can show people the issue that we're looking at here. It's April 30th to May 3rd, um, 1983. We'll have it up on the screen here in a moment. There we go. Uh, now, this is uh, TV's sexiest detective. What's worrying him? Yeah. I Doesn't feel look like, like anything. No, I was going to say, the article just says nothing. Look at a smile. Yeah. I don't think he's been uh, superseded as TV's sexiest detective since then. So I, now there's a sexier detective? No, I don't think Jerry there is. Jerry Orbach? Jerry Orbach, sexier. <laughs> oh, so, how about uh, Matthew, no, Matthew McConaughey, true detective? No. A I little too thin? He's too thin, and he doesn't have the gravitas and the humor of... It's, uh, it's true. Of Tom Selleck. Who else? Of the Leck, as I like to call him. Yeah. The Leck. The Leck. Christian Bale. See, I, called, I called him Cells. Cells? I feel like he'd call himself the Lek. Like, how you doing? It's the Lek. <laughs> I need those Hawaiian shirts pressed. <laughs> so I picked this issue because I wanted to pick an issue that I had three identical issues of. So TV Guide uh, was published differently in each region. So there yeah. were slight differentiations in each different region of the country. And these are three Boston editions. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to say I owned three Boston editions of a TV guide from April 30th is, to May 3rd, Is it because the sexiest detective was on it? Well, yeah. I wanted one for each bathroom in my home. <laughs> I, I actually don't know why I had three copies of this particular issue, but it worked out. And the, the first thing I wanted to mention was the cover is something that you don't see very often, aside from the hunk here. It's, it's an artist painting of a famous person on a magazine cover, and you never get that now. I feel like that was an incentive for people to get famous then, to yeah, get a nice portrait. Nice job with the chest hair. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think he sat for this? I don't think he would have needed to. No? You think the person <laughs> did it by memory? Well, I think you could easily have taken a photograph. They could develop film in 83. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> if he sat for it, he's a fool. 
I think I could convince a millennial that the reason this is a painting is that Tom Selleck was a vampire and therefore unphotographable. <laughs> they had to. There was nothing else they could do back then. So John's at a little bit of a disadvantage because you grew up in Chicago, right? Detroit suburbs. Okay, Detroit suburbs, uh, Chicago. Uh, no, Detroit suburbs. So you're you're on Central Time, and this is an East Coast Time TV guide. So I'm it's on a East little Coast bit. Time. Outside. You're on East Coast Time in yeah, Detroit. Detroit's East Coast. Chicago is Central. Okay, I don't yeah, know anything I didn't about. I grew up there. I only know Boston. <laughs> I didn't know I grew up there. So they didn't do anything. It wasn't an hour behind or anything like that. It was nope. normal eight to ten. All right, no. so you're no disadvantage whatsoever. Detroit is often thought of as the burned down version of Boston. Okay. <laughs> so Boston by 2024. Yeah, exactly. It's future Boston. It's I like to call it rollerball Boston. Yeah. So let's dive right in. What did you, first of all, actually, there's a next slide I wanted to say. There's a um, there's a an article in this TV guide. <laughs> that says, these are all the things you'll be able to do with videotapes in the future. The I one this guy said, oh, this guy sat for the humorous look at. Yes, because the one that disturbs me, and I don't know if you, this jumped right out at you, is have a kid. <laughs> Not be a father, just have a kid and then jog. I feel like they're all in order as well. Fix a meal, have a kid, jog. I'm not sure they understand what video cassettes are. I really don't think that they would. Uh, also, this guy has turned one of his TVs into a fireplace. <laughs> That's possible. That is possible, and this really just seems like a hobo. Like, I'm like, okay. It's a post-apocalyptic hobo. So let's jump right in. Let's go to Saturday night. Uh, what did you guys pick for your choices for the first night of... Oh, actually, I do want to mention one thing. If we can go to the next slide. Virginia Slims uh, is a cigarette that advertised in TV Guide frequently. And that's not the unusual part. The unusual part is the, the angle on this ad is that back in 1903, they had two kinds of exercise classes. His, and it's guys exercising and hers, which is women cleaning a floor. <laughs> and then the tagline is, you've come a long way, baby. You can smoke cigarettes now. I just want to set the tone for the time, 1983. I also picked one that was, I think, sort of in the era when I thought you guys probably watched the most TV, like ages eight to 12-ish, seems to be when most people kind of watch the most stuff. So 83, you were probably both watching quite a bit of TV, I'm guessing? Yeah, uh, probably a fair amount. Okay, all right. And you, you're both from families with multiple children? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but only one television. But only one television, yeah. So that is important because I think that, are you the oldest, youngest? You're the youngest, middle? I'm the youngest. Okay, so, were you, so you probably set the tone and you were just a victim of whatever the other people well, want no. to watch? No, we, well, the truth is we had one color and one black and white TV, so okay. it was important I could figure out a way to watch Buck Rogers, yeah. which I did. <laughs> on the good out. TV. Yeah. That's an important show for colors because if that alien's purple, he's the bad guy. But if it's a shade of gray, it's difficult to tell who to root for. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Buck Rogers was such a subtle show. It really was. <laughs> you it needed really the was. colors to pop. Yes. <laughs> the only gray you want on Buck Rogers is Aaron. Um, <laughs> That's why I'm the host. Solid. <laughs> so 8 o'clock on Saturday night, what did, what did you guys pick? They didn't Pulling pick together. I, I gave them these TV guides independently, so it'll be interesting um, to see if you picked the same thing. I picked Incredible Hulk. Incredible Hulk. Yeah. Did you watch that every week? Uh, I watched it a lot, but I don't know when or how. Because you're a... <laughs> some guy would show up with a tape. He would pop it in once a week. I think it might have been Bill Bixby. Yeah, it might have been just a kid who was painted green. It was, um, it was yeah. a kid who was going to puke I, all the time. I feel like I, w I remember watching it in the afternoons more than primetime, though it is clearly on at primetime. Yeah, it absolutely is. And this one is uh, David, who was Bill Bixby, who was the Incredible Hulk. Do you know why they changed his name from David Banner to Bruce Banner? The uh, show is David Banner. So that it's not a uh, alliteration? What was the reason? Because the network said Bruce was a gay name. <laughs> That's true. Really? Oh. They said the name was too gay in 1983, and they didn't want people to think Little Bruce Banner. Little did they know that David is the actual gay name. That is the gay name. I was going to say, so they went with David. Yeah. It's David. <laughs> 
There's an amazing uh, thing someone's put together on the internet where they went through every episode of The Incredible Hulk and wrote down what triggered his change in every uh-huh. episode. And it's called the Hulk, Hulk Out List. I'll put a link in the show notes, but it's 100% true and it's hilarious because it's everything from a boulder falling onto him to not having change for a payphone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We've all been there. So in this episode... Yeah. David goes to work for a wildcat oil man who has gambled everything, hoping to make a big strike. That sounds very non-superheroic. Yeah, but I'll tell you this. Linda's played by Christine Belford. Worth it for watching that alone. I'm just telling you the only other piece of information. Yeah, that TV guy has given you. I I would have watched Incredible Hulk. I was a big fan at the time, even though I was terrified of... I loved that show. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know what bothered me about Lou Ferrigno, and I don't know why this made him more scary to me? Uh-huh. The fact that he was deaf. Like, when he would do interviews, it really creeped me out. I, I'm not disparaging deaf people, but for some reason, it really yeah, made me child, scared. that can be very strange. Something about it was weird. But in the show, they never were like, by the way, the Incredible Hulk is deaf. <laughs> this is just a thing you knew about the actor yeah. that made... Although it was implied because he never spoke, <laughs> yeah. and he would have been great in The Miracle Worker. Yeah. Like that's when I when I read that story, I picture the Hulk. You think there were writers that pitched stuff where Hulk couldn't hear? Probably. Or like, they like tried to pepper jokes in where they would, or the editor would probably put in, "Hey, over here," and you know, yeah. nothing. Blue that's Hulk. just focused over here. <laughs> that's why he's behind you. Rock concert. And yeah. He's like, this doesn't bother me. Turn it up, man. Freedom rock. It's like. <laughs> Maybe they're like, that's why he was so angry if we just were able to fix his hearing. It's like the lion's paw. <laughs> Pull that thorn out and he's a pussycat. The lion's ear. Yeah. He just needs a miracle ear. So I was actually terrified of him as a person and a character, and my parents somehow confused that with me loving Lou Ferrigno as the Hulk. And for my third birthday this year, 1983, they paid a bodybuilding friend of my uncle, my gay uncle actually, not named Bruce, uh, <laughs> to paint himself green and show up at my birthday party. Wow. And I literally shit myself. <laughs> and they were like, he's so ungrateful. <laughs> huh. Still watched it though. I found the Incredible Hulk very comforting because he'd always help out in a situation where there was danger. He would, but they, they had sort of an undertone where like, he would kill the bad guy, let's say the oil baron, and like the, the woman usually who was being terror, terrorized wasn't sure if he was a good guy or not. And there was always that moment in every episode where he's like looking at her growling and she's like, are you going to murder me next? And then he kind of just jumps through a wall and leaves. Yeah. <laughs> every episode. But didn't Lou Frigno's wife come out and wasn't she one of the Bill Cosby accusers? Yes, she yeah. was. She's also in a great movie called um, uh, Black Roses about a satanic rock band. Mm. Wow. Um, <laughs> so she should know true horror. <laughs> what was your choice, John? You know, I ended up going with the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs. <laughs> also a thing about the rage inherent in a human condition. Mm-hmm, I saw, so were you I watching saw, a lot of sports? I saw that and I thought I probably would have been watching that, although I really honestly didn't even notice Incredible Hulk or TJ Hooker. And I probably would have been watching one of those but I also thought, all right, if I'm watching hockey, then I'm going to flip around during the commercials. And then I noticed a movie, Southern Comfort. Yes. And that was my choice. That is a very grim movie. And I will say that I went through this today in my hotel room just doing it. And when I saw that, I Googled it. Oh, had you not seen it before? I'd seen it a long time ago. The whole movie was on YouTube, and I sat and watched you it. You sat and hotel. watched Southern Comfort? <laughs> so it's like a time-release TV guide where you're like, I could... This is on? I'm going to watch this right now. I got the time. Yeah. What Southern Comfort I've never seen. Oh, man. You've watched it recently. Why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's about this group of National Guardsmen, although I thought the casting there would be a little old. Yeah, they are. For, for it to be like, but I guess you could be any age, right? National Guard, just do it on the weekends, right? Yeah. Weekend Warriors. Yeah. So this group of National Guardsmen down in uh, Louisiana. That's they the go southern. on some, what's that? That's the southern part. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> And they go on some just training mission in the, in the bayou, in the swamps, and they get lost, and they encounter these Cajuns, and it's their three-day Vietnam Yeah, <laughs> against these Cajun guys. It's awesome. It's Keith like Carradine's in Keith it. Keith Carradine. Fred they, Ward. They fight oh, Cajun. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. It's like someone saw Deliverance and was like, this would be a great movie without the rape. 
if we could make this movie more like maybe like a video game. But is it? But it's trained soldiers. No, but they have blanks. Their their guns yeah. are filled uh, with blanks with the training missions. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then you know they start fucking with these Cajun guys and bad move. Yeah. I don't want to give anything away, but let me just say, bad idea. <laughs> Here's the weird thing, too. There's 11 Cajun guys, and they're all named after an herb or spice. Oh, no, that's not... Uh, <laughs> the, the no, problem. it's only three of them. Yeah. yeah. yeah all, all of right. them. <laughs> but it's a pretty good movie, and it's, it's a grim sort of... Uh, oh, man, it's great. Yeah. There's some really... All right. I Would you watch... To just it. W- watching it on YouTube, would you watch movies like that, though? That's clearly not appropriate for you know, a teen or preteen at the time. Uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like I might have seen it a long time ago and okay. could have been a young person. Were there rules in your households about what you could and couldn't watch, like appropriateness wise or amount of television? Oh, my mom was too high to give a shit. Nice. Just having a kid like that guy. Hey, you come a long way, baby. Uh, there were, but I mean, I feel like by early teens, it's just kind of whatever. All bets are off. Now, did they yeah. have on TV out here? We did. It was. Uh, it was. It got a little dirty at night. Because I'd go to my cousins. we just watch it on TV yeah. and probably watch stuff like that. American Ecstasy. Did he have a satellite dish? I don't remember. I feel like everyone in America for a five-year period had a dirtbag cousin with a satellite dish. <laughs> <laughs> you got a tax break or something. <laughs> and, a, and an above-ground pool. Mm. Those were, you had to buy those as a package. <laughs> no, they had a, a below-ground pool. They had a very nice house. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so nine o'clock, would you guys go with? Because you, you went for an hour show, and uh, hockey is more than an hour, though. I imagine you're watching. I went hockey right? and Southern Comfort. Both. That's my time block. Then I went out and murdered forty-five people. <laughs> I was flipping around between live hockey and just Cajuns, <laughs> raging Cajuns, attacking these guys. I feel like there, you know, there was uh, there isn't really. Any, I mean, Love Boat, I guess a little. But Love really, Boat was I pretty go good. Back to, uh, the Buck Rogers that was on earlier, I would just have watched that instead. And just sat in silence and reminisced? I would have it and then watched it at nine. Did you have a VCR back then? Probably not in 83, but maybe somewhere around 86 or Okay. Seven. I can't remember when. Uh, I remember finding out about VCRs and I was like, so I could watch Superman at any time. <laughs> I was very excited. I was at in home? Canada. Yeah. And Who? then I made people rent Superman. Nice. Then, the original. Uh, yeah, yeah, the only one. It was 1983. There was only like one or two of them. Right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. That's true. It wasn't Superman. Uh, Love Boat that night, uh, Minnie Pearl is in the episode, and I swear this guy was in every single Love Boat, even though he wasn't, Burt Convy. And uh, it's a very special musical episode of Love Boat, and weirdly the TV guy chooses to point out the musical highlights of the episode and who sings the songs. <laughs> um, and you will find out that Will the Circle Be Unbroken? is uh, sung by Dottie West. Which would, well, are there people who are like, oh, what yeah, are we gonna watch? Highlights. Well, there's musical highlights. I will tune into this. And a couple is plagued by three orphans in search of a mom. Yeah, maybe I would watch that. It's a little editorializing to say plagued by, isn't it? Because orphans normally, they're like, cute orphans need a mom. And this one's like, these stupid orphans will not let these people enjoy their cruise ship. I, yeah, I don't know how orphans... I guess I'll have to watch the episode to see how orphans got onto a cruise ship. I'm thinking stowaway, but maybe it's like some kind of contest they won by selling stamps. Do orphans don't, still do that? I don't know. You'd have to ask the 80s. Orphans were huge in the 80s. Why was orf? I feel like orphans were just a gigantic theme in so many shows in the 80s where I was completely terrified that my parents would die at any moment because I just saw so many orphans on television. That's true. There was a lot of, uh, a lot orf- of orphans. orphan stuff. Webster, you had different strokes, Punky Brewster, uh, who wasn't a real orphan. Her mother just abandoned her at a shopping mall. Um, Is that the premise of Punky Brewster? That's the Brewster? premise of Punky Brewster. Her mother parks in a shopping mall in, in Chicago, where you're from. <laughs> but oh, Chicago, I know that yeah, mall. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, you, might, you might have seen it in the news. Chicago um, Mall. Yeah. Um, she parks in a shopping mall and is like, I'm just going to run in and get something and doesn't come out for three days. So then Punky squats in a, in a, like a, a crappy abandoned apartment building and confirmed bachelor George Gaines, who is the uh, superintendent of the building, finds her dancing and is like, you'll be my daughter now, Punky. Have I showed you my French cuffs? Um, 
That was the premise of that huh. children's show. Well, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. Pitched and sold. Sold. <laughs> that one came from Brendan Tartikoff, the president of the station at the time. He said, I want a show called Punky Brewster because that's the name of a girl I grew up with. I really don't care what else. Figure out the rest. Yeah, that's what he used to do. That's your guy's <laughs> jobs. Oh. Orphan, I don't give whatever. give a fuck what it is. Just whatever. To- just to be clear, it was then very successful. It was a huge show, yeah. It had an so animated uh, series as and well. And just to be clear, that's how Brandon Tartikoff talks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tartikoff, hey, business. it's the tot. Let me tell you something. Punky Bruce to make it happen. But that's, he did that with Miami Vice as well. He told Michael Mann he wanted, quote, MTV cops. And then he's like, okay. Yeah, done. Yeah. That's how did shows it. got made in the 80s. Uh, so Can I read one quick thing yeah, I just yeah, saw, which is really highly enjoyable? And we were kind of talking about this before the show. Like, it just yeah. seems like it'd be fun to get to write these. This is some TV movie called Cowboy, <laughs> starring Ted Danson, Annie Potts, I love Randy Annie Potts. Quaid, and George DeCenzo or DeCenzo as Bentlow. But it says, a modern day Western with an old time odor theme. O A T E R. What is an odor? Does anyone know what an odor is? That was like variety speak for Western. Variety speak for Western? Yeah. Would anyone use that phrase in 1983? A a modern day Western with an old time Western theme? Yeah. (laughs) So is there... What is this Western like? Well, it's kind of like a Western. (laughs) Wow. They must have had the world's greatest thesaurus at TV Guide. Can you think of another way to say Western? And they just have some old man chained to a, to a file cabinet in the Odor. basement of the building? Odor. <laughs> but then it says, a city feller, spelled F-E-L-L-E-R. Oh, played by James Brolin, not credited with the main ah. cast. Good old Long, Jimmy. Longs for a home on the range, but varmints want his land. Varmints are like Western rats. <laughs> I'm guessing Ted Danson played a varmint. How many bands in, let's say, the Pacific Northwest are called odor varmints? <laughs> <laughs> Three or four, maybe? It's, it also says, after the description, a 1983 TV movie. Right. Which is quite obvious from the rest of it as well. <laughs> it's 1983 right now. You're watching a movie on TV. It's this movie. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide? Actually, there's one thing on this that I don't want to mention. World Championship Kickboxing tonight from Caesars Palace. Super fight of the decade. I just really love the, the clip art they've used uh, of just the foot kicking a boxer in the head right there with the Budweiser bow tie. I would have been very, very drawn in by that ad to watch that. And this probably. guy only has four toes. Yeah, yeah. That's Am I uh, missing a toe? No, no, that's four toes. That's four toe Wallace. He was a very famous oh, yeah, right. kickboxer. Um, he yeah. had that weird kind of tumor on the side of his foot. <laughs> that's the fifth toe. Um, <laughs> that's why he was so good at kickboxing. That would be, if this was now, that would be like, look at this Photoshop before and after. They, they're trying to get a, a vision of beauty in kickboxing where you have four toes and, and one on the ball of your foot. And this guy's just like, Ugh, get those toes away from me. <laughs> it's not even a good kickboxing. It's like an like, odor reader ad. <laughs> Guys, I got my big TV guide ad coming out soon. And then he's like, the back of my head. Um, <laughs> Sunday night, the Lord's night. <laughs> what did you guys go with at 8 o'clock? No, Sunday night. Well, I kind of went all the way through. I've never heard of this movie. But uh, there was a big ad for it. Where is it? Where's the big ad? Yeah, here it is. Uh, Steven Spielberg's 1941 starring Dan Aykroyd oh, yeah. and John Belushi. You've never heard of that movie? Not really. Really? Steven wow. Spielberg made a movie with Dan a- No, no one had told me. Yeah. You didn't... Did it do very, very well? It was a huge bomb. Yeah, not, not a good one, but he made it. Yeah. It almost ruined his career. Steven Spielberg or the re- others? Everybody involved. Um... <laughs> It was a huge movie. John movies. Candy, John yeah, Candy. Belushi, yeah. Aykroyd. Eddie Deason. Who? Eddie Deason. Oh, Deezen. yeah, right. Poor guy, right? Hard, yeah. hard times. Yeah. No. Um, so I would so I've read. watch it, and then I'd go, oh. Ugh. 
And would you be like, is this a documentary about World War II? It's from 1979, and it was supposed to be Belushi's huge uh, film debut, really. And, mm -hmm. and Animal House was supposed to be like this little movie no one cared about. And 1941 had a, a comic book adaptation that came out. So did Steven Spielberg write and direct this? He directed it, but I believe it was written by Robert Zemeckis. And oh. uh, Chris Columbus had a, a pass of at the script as well. Yeah, it's an amazing cast. It's a movie that uh, doesn't get a lot of love now for kind of good reason, uh, but it's sort of a beautiful mess. Like, it's a pretty entertaining movie to watch. It's, it's like a comedic Heaven's Gate. <laughs> the, the Errol Morris documentary? No, uh, about the... <laughs> About the pet cemeteries? Yeah. Uh, no, the, the gates of heaven. Sorry, yes, gates of heaven. <laughs> it was but a I'm huge bit of flop. Yes, it's true. Um, it was a huge. I mean, they spent like two years making this movie, and, and it was one of the most expensive comedies ever made at that point. And is it? Would you say it's the Ishtar of 1983 or 79? I would say yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, yeah, there's well, a lot I'm of sorry music. I wanted to see it. No, no, it's worth watching. It has Robert Stack and Christopher Lee. Yeah, um, no, it's got, I mean, talk about having Warren Oates and, and uh, Ned Beatty. Not Ned Beatty Jr. No, I'm just saying what it says here. In the TV guide. So let's move on to the next slide, because that's this night before John uh, tells what he's going to uh, say. Um, because this was on tonight as well. Uh, TV's bloopers, you goofed again. Uh, this was a big one, and I think would have been better than 1941. Um, but John, what did you go with? I went with that. You went with TV's bloopers? Well, because I was like, censored. Okay. <laughs> did you think it would just be boobs and stuff? Well, it's just like, why show a censored blooper? Yeah, they would a lot. Odd. Is it just, is it bloop, bloop? Are you censoring swear words? Yeah. Or? And they would, so bloopers were... It just seemed like a really lame name. TV, it just seems like, it bloopers, that sounds fun. Oh, censored, who gives a shit? It's just a black screen for an hour. <laughs> we told you. Um, but this was, uh, TV's bloopers started in 1980 as a series of specials. And by this point, they tried to make it a weekly show. And there was actually two rival shows, one of which was called Foul Ups, Bleeps, and Blunders. <laughs> Uh, that was hosted by Don Rickles, and one was called Life's Most Embarrassing Moments that was hosted by Steve Allen. And this one is the one that made it uh, because it had Dick Clark, clearly, and Ed McMahon, Boston's own. Uh, and it was interesting for people because you never saw bloopers. They were like this myth mythical thing, and you got to see sort of behind the screen. And there was a guy named Kermit, I forget his last name, who created the, the blooper. He used, to, he used to tape radio bloopers and release them as LPs. And then in the 70s, would transcribe bloopers and release them as books. <laughs> and this was popular. This was popular. So you could... Is this before the invention of candy or walking around? I think it was... <laughs> it was during the flat earth. I invented walking around. <laughs> Wait a minute, you can Someone just... did, right? So it sounds more fun than reading a yeah. blooper. Because you're like, wait, we can just walk without a destination in mind? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you could, and you can get them on Amazon. They're super cheap. They're like little paperback books. I would then, hope they're super cheap. <laughs> they're huge collector's market. But I always wondered, like, because I would see them at flea markets and used bookstores all the time, and I'm like, did people just read or, like, read these out loud to each other? Now I want to have, like, a stage reading of a bunch of bloopers. You should, because they really <laughs> are. <laughs> like oddly than scripted. It's like someone calling a character by the actor's name, and they're like, transcribe that. <laughs> <laughs> or like a flub of a line, and someone's like, wow, this is hilarious. Um, but so they were showing them on these, and it was very, very popular for a number of years until they ran out of bloopers, and they started having to do practical jokes as well, including oh. one on Stevie Wonder. No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so I would have watched this most nights, but uh, if we go to the next slide, there's something else I want to point out was on uh, Good Night Beantown, uh, a show that you're probably familiar with it from the Dropkick Murphys song. Uh, they don't have a song about Goodnight Bean Town, as people sing. But this was a show starring Incredible Hulk himself, uh, Bill Bixby, and he played uh, a Boston news anchor that was forced to co-anchor the news with his ex-wife. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was based on a, a famous couple here in Boston, Chet and Natalie. Uh -huh. who were, were they divorced? Uh, I believe they were divorced at the time. Wow. So, uh, this Chet? Was, yeah. Chet and Natalie are here. Um, so I think Chet's dead. But um, so he's still here. Um, but this was based on, it was a very Boston-centric show, and it was a very weird single-camera sort of dramedy. Oh, really? Which you don't really get by the, the ad here. 
which shows them just in the rain. And this was the debut, and I would have been very excited about this because it was a show set in Boston, and we didn't have a lot of those at the time. Yeah, we had was what? Uh, Spencer for Hire? Spencer for Hire started in 85. Cheers started in 83, and before that was James at 15, which ended in 1980. What, what did we have before that? James at 15 with Lance Kerwin. It was the show that uh, Kevin Williamson based Dawson's Creek on. No. Oh. Which is very weird. Wow. Uh, but uh, you didn't have, did you have any shows set in Detroit at the time? Um, or Ann Arbor? Besides hockey. <laughs> the Iggy Pop sitcom <laughs> set in Ann Arbor? Yeah, it was just the Stooges. Yeah, MC5 House. <laughs> <laughs> just like the young ones. I'm trying to think if there were any Detroit shows. I can't think of any Detroit shows Never ever. <laughs> ever. What's what? that? Magnum PI, but not Detroit. Uh, Magnum PI was PI set was a show, in Hawaii. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The so exact so your answer. Your answer to the to the question: Were there any shows based in Detroit? Was Magnum PI, but not Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> There's this one show that's not set in Detroit that I'm gonna name. Yeah, Magnum PI was probably the least set in Detroit show I can think of. Uh, yeah. He wore a hat of the Detroit Tigers. Where was Facts yeah. of Life but, based? Do you, Facts of Life was based in Peekskill, New York, upstate New York. Did this Thank person you. in the audience think that wearing a Detroit Tigers hat made you, it was like an embassy? <laughs> like, if you wear that hat, it's technically Detroit soil, no matter anything under that hat. Was there ever a RoboCop sitcom? There was a RoboCop TV series, but it was filmed in Canada. And yeah, it was set in New Detroit, actually. It wasn't shot Yeah, there. but yeah. that's probably in the, that was in the 90s. That was in the 90s. RoboCop had a series of TV movies, including RoboCop, Dark Justice. Uh, <laughs> and in a, in a syndicated uh, hour-long TV show and an animated series. And actually, the RoboCop TV series was produced by Ken Johnson, who did The Incredible Hulk. Yeah. And also did the thing I would have watched God, this evening. Wealth of knowledge. Yeah, I know. The amount you know is somewhere amazed. between amazing and upsetting. It, yeah. <laughs> if you think that's true for you just hearing it, think of how true that is for me having to have it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 9 o'clock, would you go with Eugene? You're watching oh, 1941 uh, nine all night? O'clock. No, I was like, well, after seeing the first hour of 1941, I was like, ugh. And <laughs> I switched right to uh, V, part one. Yes. Terrified. Did you pick yeah. V? Stanley Cup playoffs. Okay, yeah. Stanley Cup playoffs. <laughs> While you're yeah. watching that, lizard people are taking over the world. V was a huge deal at this time. Yeah. I mean, everyone was talking about V. This was a this was a made-for-TV miniseries. I don't know why I said made-for-TV. There wasn't like they used to do miniseries in the theaters. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess every movie is technically a miniseries. Um, and this was originally supposed to be a show about neo-Nazis taking over the U.S. And Ken Johnson, again, the guy who created The Incredible Hulk for television and The Bionic Man, uh, did this show for NBC, and he pitched it as a show about the rise of neo-Nazi fascists taking over America. And mm -hmm. they said no, and then he said, they're aliens, and they said yes. <laughs> That's literally how he pitched that show. Nice. And well, this was a two-night event, and it was terrifying at the yeah, time. Yeah, I remember being, yeah. Very scared. The people had basically skin masks and were aliens underneath, and you found out at the end of the first episode, so I just ruined it for you, where Diana, who was the, the, like the queen of these aliens and was very hot, she was played by Jane Botter, who was a uh, former Miss New Hampshire, uh, from New Hampshire, and uh, the final, yeah. She lives in Australia you now. You've been a doctor. I know. <laughs> I've done nothing for humanity. No, you no, you've recorded it. You're like Uthu the Watcher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Marvel Comics reference. Yes. Everyone. There was a Marvel Comics V series. Do you remember that? No, but I know. <laughs> but I know you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Marvel Comics also published a comic book adaptation of 1941 that was the first published comic work by Stephen Bissett and Rick Veach, who went on to do Swamp Thing. <laughs> but anyway, um... Are you gonna have children when you... No! Decide? No, court ordered, no. No, I, I, um... I would not have children. Okay. Uh, they'd, like to. they'd be forced to read these as their nighttime books. They would. They would. Let's sit down and read the synopsis of Goodnight Beantown tonight, kids. <laughs> I don't need to buy you children's books. Look at all the books we have. Yeah. You know how many TV shows you can watch, quote unquote? That I can tell you about? Yeah. So V was terrifying, and I remember going into school, and that was the talk of the schoolyard at my school, where everybody had seen this thing when it was revealed they were aliens, because they kind of kept it under wraps back then. You just thought it was, they, they, were, they came and were like, we're here to help you. And then it was like, they're here to eat us. Yeah. 
because the scene where in the, in the cliffhanger in the first episode, which also starred the Beastmaster himself. <laughs> Who's the Beastmaster? Mark Singer. Mark Singer, I knew that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you guys have cable growing up? I watched, I don't even know how many times I watched Beastmaster. Yeah, you must have had HBO. If it was on cable, I watched it every time. I had cable starting at some point, yeah. Because there was a, a joke that, I don't know who came up with this, but that HBO stood for, hey, Beastmaster's on. <laughs> <laughs> because it was on so much. Whenever I got cable, it was after the Beastmaster. It was arrived. after, well, TBS, which kind of took over the, the baton for HBO, people would say, it's the Beastmaster station. Did you say, tis the Beastmaster? Tis the Beastmaster station. Boy, that is my new favorite joke for sure. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because hey, Beastmaster's on. Hey, Beastmaster's on. The other HBO joke, did you guys have this one? You'd it's ask. a universal joke. Anywhere you are in the world, you're going to enjoy it. guys get HBO here? Is, hey, Beastmaster! Will you uh, do me a favor and have that translated to every language? Abs- hey, Beastmaster's on. Well, I got news for you, John. I've just done that. No, um, <laughs> the UN. There's the guy at the mic, and he's like, "Hey, Beastmaster's on." And then you see all the translators going. But uh, Beastmaster was so popular on TBS that they made a made-for-TBS sequel called Beastmaster Two: Through the Portal of Time with Curry Wurr. Was that popular? No. <laughs> Is Beastmaster a movie? Yeah, or, it was okay. a movie done by Don Corscarelli, who did the Phantasm movies. And it's about a mass, um, a beast who's mad. It's What's about it Mark about? Singer, who's kind of like Tarzan, except he has ferrets. Is it fun? Tanya Roberts is naked in it. Yeah, that's a huge plus. Yeah. Sounds Watch like Southern Comfort movie. and Beastmaster. Yeah. There was a series of PG movies that had nudity that was like a loophole for kids because HBO would show them before 8 o'clock at night. They wouldn't show nudity movies till after 8 o'clock except for this small group of PG movies which I have committed to memory like everyone from my generation. <laughs> Which is mostly the Beastmaster? Beastmaster? Do you know them? What's that? Do you know these PG movies? PG movies? PG movies with nudity? There's, there's many people in my age range who would just rattle it off like the up, up, down, down, contra. <laughs> it's like those are the two pieces of information. And they're like, yeah, the PG movies are nudity. There's Beastmaster, The Invisible Kid, 16 Candles, <laughs> and Nuns on the Run. Okay. No, I thought they mostly are movies had nudity. Well, that's, you could have had a much more robust childhood. Oh, no, well. <laughs> I'll try to watch those now. <laughs> the dad from Good Times is also in Beastmaster. He is. Oh, good. John Amos. Sorry, I don't know his name. John Amos. And he was terrifying in Beastmaster. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Was he naked? (laughs) That's why he was terrifying, (laughs) Eugene. And he kept calling uh, Mark Singer JJ. I didn't really understand it. But uh, V, the cliffhanger of the first episode, is Diana comes into her, like, office and has these guinea pigs. And you're like, oh, that's cool. The The aliens kick guinea pigs. And then she unhinges her jaw and eats it. Oh. Now you're like, oh no, what's going to happen tomorrow night? <laughs> right, if they'll eat this, maybe they'll eat people. They'll probably eat us. So I would have watched that for sure. That is an excellent thing. And if we can go to the next slide for a second, uh, as we move on to Tuesday. I did want to point out this. This was a local news story called Prisoners of Fear. That was a five-part report on the causes and treatments or of different fears and phobias with Amaya Baleta who was a uh, very popular local uh, news anchor, they would never have a story like this on local news now. It was pretty heavy full page ad with, uh, for the people listening, is a man in a box. <laughs> and some people it's heights, others crowds are oh, flying and it's all about phobias. Do you guys have any phobias? Like legit phobias? Hmm. I don't think I have like a, there's like definitely, like I wouldn't love to be surrounded by bugs, but it's not a phobia. Nobody would like to be surrounded no. by bugs. In fact, if you love that, I think whatever the opposite of a phobia is, that's yeah. a mental illness would be. Right, right. A fetish? Is a, phobia, is a fetish the opposite of a phobia? I don't know. Let's say it is. No. So it's not like a phobia, phobia makes you uncome. Well, <laughs> I think by its nature it should. <laughs> Enjoy this new expression. Yes. Also probably a band in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I had a million dollars, I would safely bet that I've never heard anyone say uncome. <laughs> Is that like the seven up of sex? It's the yeah. uncola. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make you uncome. <laughs> Do you have any phobias, John? None? Uh, I don't know, I'll just say spiders. Spiders, not an insect. An arachnid. That's right. Great. Eight. <laughs> I'm going to go with spiders. Yeah. 
Uh, so let's move on to Monday night, 8 o'clock. If we go to the next slide as well. Um, <laughs> there's a movie on that we'll talk about in a moment on this Monday night. But uh, Eugene, what'd you go with at 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock? What did I do? Must have... Hmm. There's a lot of movies on Monday night. Monday night in the early 80s was oh. a very TV show light night, and they would always show Monday night movies. I picked for Monday night uh, Battlestar Galactica. So you loved that show. I liked Battlestar Galactica. I loved Buck Rogers. Okay, so you're, you are a huge sci-fi fan. But I mean, if, if like, I don't know what Love, Sydney is. That was uh, the first show with a gay character. Sounds very good, but it's not uh, people fighting in outer space. No, Love Sydney was Tony Randall of The uh -huh. Odd Couple. Swoozy Kurtz. Swoozy Kurtz. And he Swoozy. Swooz. The Swooz. Patrick Swoozy. <laughs> she, um, <laughs> that's not his real name. His real name is Swoozy Kurtz. Um, but Love Sydney was about Tony Randall. He was a, a gay man uh, where they never really came out and said it, but everybody knew in America who had uh, some children that he had adopted. And it was sort of a, a, a groundbreaking show for the time that everybody hated. <laughs> Did not last very long, <laughs> but it got a lot of press at the time. Uh, I would not have watched that. Uh, John, what did you go with at 8 o'clock? Uh, I went with That's Incredible. I feel like I really watched that a lot. I watched that in all real the time. life. I that might have watched it. It, it was, seems familiar. Is that where people did something amazing with nails and? Yes, it was. Uh, like it was always better nails. It should have been called better nails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was so. But for sci-fi, better nails, etc. Better nails, and then some other things, and someone with no legs who does something amazing. But better nails is really the the top build here. Uh, sci-fi was it had a huge boom after Star Wars, obviously, which has been well documented, but. There was a lot of sci-fi TV at the time, which was probably pretty cool if you're a kid that was into sci-fi. Yeah. And you could watch and like everything. Like you, there wasn't camps of people being like, you like Buck Rogers? I'm a Battlestar Galactica person. I hate you. Right. <laughs> that's not a thing now, right? I think that's a thing now. I feel like people are like, I like DC movies and I hate you because you like Marvel movies or like... That's not a real thing. I feel like that's, that's a thing, everybody. Isn't that a thing? Yeah, grown-ups are like, I'm Star Trek, not Star Wars. Really? I've, I've seen it come to blows. I hope it does. <laughs> Remember the sci-fi wars? Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of fun shows were on, and, and decent budget shows. Do you remember the Buck Rogers episode, the most terrifying Buck Rogers episode with the space vampire? Yeah. Wow. Totally yeah. remember the space vampire. That I still have nightmares about. Is that also the one where there was a lot of 70s roller skating? Yes. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. Yes. Yeah. See, I really do recall it. What was this robot's name? Uh, Twiggy. Tweaky. Tweaky, that's right. It was and not Twiggy. Twiggy, yeah, yeah. right? Twiggy was a and model. The, and Tweety was his robot girlfriend. Yes. And Tweety, then, of Tweety. course, Dr. Theopolis was the thing he carried around <laughs> that was real smart. His sentient uh, chest? Yeah. His sentient chest. <laughs> it would be funny if, he, if people had trouble not talking to his chest. And he's like, my eyes are up here. But your intelligence is in your chest. I'm very confused now. <laughs> Could have really explored some social issues with Buck Rogers. Yeah, but I remember that little robot. They did like a maybe it was at the end of the episode, like something where he went beady, beady, beady. Yeah, Lahayim. Lahayim. <laughs> well, Mel Blanc did do his voice, and he was a famous Jewish person. Oh, maybe that's why I liked it so much. It had this. It had a sort of Shabbat quality. It was a Shabbat. It. <laughs> Most of Buck Rogers was a very thinly coated Jewish allegory. <laughs> like that time where the ship flies for seven days on one day's worth of fuel. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I, uh, whenever I go to Los Angeles... The ambassador whose head you could take off. Yes, yeah. Every time I go to LA, we try to stay in the Bonaventure Hotel because it was featured partially because it was featured in Buck Rogers as uh, a hotel of the future. <laughs> 1976's Hotel of the Future. <laughs> There's a great movie, sci-fi movie, that reminds me quite a lot of Buck Rogers that was on HBO all the time that you, I'm sure you've seen, Ice Pirates. A long time ago, but I don't remember it You should well. revisit Ice Pirates. All I right. think it would change your life. We'll do it later. Uh, so That's Incredible is what I would have gone with. I'm agreeing with, with John here. And my favorite thing about this description is it just says scheduled. Because it doesn't want you to get disappointed <laughs> if what you think is on isn't actually on. And it says, the landing of a hot air balloon atop another balloonist. A man who competes in marathons while lying on a gurney. And this could have helped the Incredible Hulk. Lasers used in ear microsurgery. 
A procedure for controlling muscles through electrical implants. My muscles are out of control. Get me a laser. <laughs> I would have gone with that for sure. Now, nine o'clock, this was a difficult decision for me. What did you guys go with? Uh, the conclusion of V. Yeah. I, I was leaning towards that until I saw this other thing I'm going to talk about in a moment. Is it movie A Little Sex? It's not movie A Little Sex, which is a movie I've never seen or heard of. Uh, and it sounds very terrifying at that time. There would be sort of sexual things on TV. I mean, not really overt things, but would you guys be watching TV with your parents usually, or would you be kind of alone or with your siblings? B both, I think. I, uh, probably not with my parents, because they didn't need any Buck Rogers. Right. And I needed a lot. Maybe the A-Team. Murder, okay. she wrote, we would watch You'd together. watch that. So you weren't in danger of like the, the awkward sexual thing being on TV with your parents, and then it's silence for like an hour after. <laughs> Like, I would see a promo for a We didn't watch Police Academy together a lot. Police Academy? <laughs> yeah, we didn't constantly watch that. <laughs> Police Academy, the first one, people forget how dirty that first movie Very is. Very dirty. Yeah. Dad, I don't forget. Dad, can we, can we go to the Blue Oyster? Yeah. Yes, no, the first one is full of homophobic jokes and nudity. Yeah. Can't yeah. believe it was a hit in the 80s. And when that was very frowned upon. Yeah. And uh, George Gaines, who played Punky's father. Commandant Lassard in the oh, really? Academy movies, yeah. Oh, look at him. Guy was on top Glad of the it world. Glad it worked out for him. <laughs> <laughs> on top of the world. <laughs> so what did you go with, uh, 9 o'clock? Uh, USL football, USFL football. So you're kind of a jock. Wranglers and invaders. <laughs> do you Just watch look. a lot of sports still? I still do, a fair amount. Were you playing a lot of sports? I was watching what? sports on my phone he before was. the show. He was streaming a hockey game NHL on playoffs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Eugene was, uh, was streaming Buck Rogers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were using Eugene's sci-fi technology to watch sports. <laughs> <laughs> I would not have watched either of those things, I think, although as much as I loved V, I was intrigued by a TV movie I had never heard of, which is up on the screen for the people here in the crowd tonight. It is a movie called Legs. <laughs> And I wish it said so much 71 gorgeous legs. Yeah, that, is my, that was my first thing. It's about the world's first one-legged dancer. <laughs> and, then that's, and then you're like, now I gotta check this out. Yeah, 36 beautiful girls, 72 gorgeous legs. On stage, they're the world's greatest high-kicking chorus line. But when the show is over, the struggle for stardom and the search for love began. A look at what really goes on backstage with those fabulous rockets. And it stars John Hurd of Chud fame. Uh, also the dad in uh, everyone's favorite Christmas movie, Home Alone. And also the uh, bartender in After Hours, my favorite Martin Scorsese movie. <laughs> But that sounded intriguing to me. I, that's something I would like to watch now because I feel like V, we can see all the time. I think this very theater has shown it. Legs, not really getting shown a lot these days. <laughs> Probably not something you can really <laughs> rent. Uh, and before we move on to t Tuesday, if we could go to the next slide. This is a 10, a 10 p.m. show. Oh, there's V, obviously. Uh, very, very good. Next slide for a second. The aliens are friends. This is a terrifying ad for that evening's Cagney and Lacey. It's, it actually says a very special episode on it, first of all, as if you couldn't tell. And it's a woman just absolutely in fear, and it says, who can a battered wife turn to when her husband is a cop? I don't know if you guys picked up there, but it means that the cop is the one beating her. <laughs> I don't I feel like they wouldn't do a TV show about that now. Like, I feel uh, like that issue... Don't they make movies? Like, isn't there a movie called about that? A, I don't know. Battered cop? No, but I mean, I feel like... Uh, like I don't lifetime... Know. Cops are certainly, you know, occasionally vilified on Twitter. Very, very rarely. That, that seemed like a really, uh, uh, kind of a big deal to show in 1983. Oh, yeah. I don't mean to say that it isn't, sorry, I think it's a big deal to do this in 1983. I think yeah. people would still do it now. You think, okay. I, I feel like it would be, um, I don't know, I feel like it'd be more controversial now. But oh, like this would be too... Uh, polarizing. Oh, and they'd want to, they wouldn't want to make people fight each other? Yeah, I think that they would be like, guys, just fight over the Battlestar Galacta versus uh, Buck Rogers thing, and let's leave the can of copy a wife beater stuff off the table. <laughs> but a show that people kind of laugh at Cagney and Lacey now, it's, a, it's sort of a punchline show. You know what it is? I feel like uh, Law & Order has definitely had like stuff like this. Probably. Uh, they have a lot of... Grim things. pretty dark. Really? Law & Order is... 
It's set in Hawaii, right? Is that the one? <laughs> yeah. With Burt yes. Reynolds? Uh, Solving beach crimes. Beach crimes. <laughs> beach assault. Is that your little Oscar? Because I think you stole it. Yeah. There were six beers in here earlier today. <laughs> You've soiled my towel. It's a two-parter. Uh, <laughs> Let's move on to Tuesday night, May 3rd, 1983. I'm assuming you guys picked what I have to imagine you did for 8 o'clock, but what did you guys go with? Tuesday night. I mean, I picked my favorite show, yeah. which was the A-Team. Yeah. I think that was everyone's favorite show in 1983. <clears throat> I think it was certainly the number one and two show. Of the, did you like the A-Team? Did not watch the A-Team. <laughs> What'd you go with? I went with... Um, Stanley Cup playoffs? St well, of course. I went with the B team. It was a show. I went Stanley Cup playoffs and uh, the deer hunter. Wow. Okay. You're a mature child. Um, you know, after this violent sporting event, I'd like to see something with maybe Christopher Walken and Russian roulette in it. The deer hunter was actually the first uncut movie shown on over-the-air television. It was shown by TV38, a local Boston television station, and they showed it completely unedited. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. In what year? 1980. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was was it to scare children? I think it was to scare children. They were like, guys, don't go to Vietnam. It's been over for 10 years now, but we'd like you not to ever let that happen again. Uh, so you didn't watch a lot of the hour-long action shows? You were like pretty much all sports all the time? Probably a lot of sports. I never got into A-Team. Um... Watched a lot of Love Boat. So Love Boat was okay. Well, it was just, you know, was, my parents were divorced. So it was always, you know, go to my dad's for the weekend and just, oh, well, watch uh, Love Boat and that's incredible and uh, Entertainment Weekly or whatever that show was. Entertainment like, Tonight. Tonight. So yeah. My stepmom watched that a lot. And Did, then I'd watch sports. But I remember, I feel like I'm probably older than you guys too. So maybe for me it was, you know, Deer Hunter was my thing. It was in my... Yeah. Would you, watch the, viewing. would you watch that with your dad? Like, go over to his house on the weekend and watch Deer Hunter? No, that was more like me and my cousin watching on TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did watching you have stuff like that. It was like, oh, this is cool. It's army stuff. And then like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel weird about the military-industrial complex now. And for a moment, I thought I was going to... This De Niro flamethrowering, all those yeah. guys. And then, of course, all the Russian list stuff. It's just, oh, this is kind of... This has changed my outlook on things yeah. quite a bit. You know what was an odd phenomenon too, was at this time you had very negative things set in a pretty recent war. And you don't have that in a lot of popular culture these days. There's not like crazy Vietnam, you know, crazy Iraqi war vets coming back on, on Law and Order. Right, a little, but people. not a ton. Yeah. Not like the 18, not like a whole thing. It's like, these people were framed in Iraq. Yeah. Now they just help people out in the desert. <laughs> the U.S. government screwed these guys over, and now they're just kind of, you know, having fun. They, they drive around in an identifiable van, <laughs> helping widows. So what was it about that, that show that was your favorite show of all time? Um, it was, first of all, super fun. It yeah. was intentionally, I think, both actiony and really funny. Yeah. Murdoch. Super funny, B.A., what a nice guy, loved yeah. kids, helped orphans. Uh, Hannibal was so confident. There's a uh, famous thing about him where every single thing he was ever in, George Papard, he would introduce himself to all the actors. Have you ever heard this about him? No. His line would be, I'm George Papard, I'm not a nice man. Uh, and then he would be just a complete jerk to everybody. Oh, really? Yeah, I guess on the set of the A-Team, he was very mad that that was supposed to be his show. Yeah, not B.A.'s. Not B.A.'s. And Mr. T is Mr. T. Obviously, he's going to be the biggest star in the history of the world. It's Mr. T. It's a seven-foot-tall black man who dresses like an Indian and wears 48,000 pounds of gold. <laughs> Can you think of a person now who would be on a show cast as a character that they just let show up dressed like they dress? <laughs> That like, wasn't a reality show. Yeah, like that's like Lady Gaga right. getting cast in a show about Iraqi war vets and showing up dressed in a bubble suit. And people were like, yeah, well, that's her character. Yeah. It's a big deal. Very, very weird. So he would have these sort of standoffs on the set where like he wouldn't leave his trailer until Mr. T left his trailer and they would go like overrun shooting time and all this stuff was a big deal. No. Oh. I want to point well, out... none of that came off on screen. No, that chemistry was fantastic. And then you had Dirk Benedict from Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, Dirk Benedict, who... Uh, he now does, I think, like co co like, uh, like political commentary. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's good. It's... Interesting. It's uh, involved. It, his, his... Anyway, I can't remember it, but his explanation of why Battlestar got canceled was something that w uh, was really funny. <laughs> 
it was like a combination of misunderstanding uh, how like TV worked and sexism. Yeah. Something like that. Hey, but can anyway. you green light uh, another season of Battlestar Galactica with more chicks in it? Cancel it? That's exactly how it went. <laughs> it was a misunderstanding. I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna blame? Fax machines. Yeah. It was the early days of fax technology. Yes. Uh, I wanna go to the next slide because I can show you what the A-Team was about that night. This was kind of shocking to me. The A-Team was a comedic look at hijacking, which happened in media a lot at this time. Hijacking was a pretty common cliche for comedies. Because no one had really, and someone can correct me, no one had really died in a hijacking by this point. It was like they'd kidnap people or they'd, or they'd be like, take this plane to Cuba. And it would come up all the time. Like, like they'd have a TV show where like some frat dudes would hijack a plane to go to spring break. Like that would be the plot line of something. And this one it goes, hijack a hijacked plane, BA stuck in the belly of a Boeing, Murdoch's at the controls, flying blind, cause he's crazy. And Hannibal stranded in the control tower and just the wacky, Win loser draw esque cartoon they've used here, where they've made uh, Murdoch look very much like Vern, uh, like Ernest. <laughs> but can you imagine, like, there was a guy whose full time job was drawing wacky TV guide ads for a living? Yeah. And that would be a thing he would put on his Friendster profile. Yeah, yeah. One day. But could you imagine making a comedic thing about hijacking now? I mean, I'm sure you, I would wait another year. Yeah. <laughs> Calendar year so the, or financial year? <laughs> school year. School yeah. year, yeah. It's a September thing. Yeah. Like, I feel like you could not even pitch that to anyone. No, that's yeah. crazy. Now this I really is. want to. Now it's like a dare. That's a challenge. That's why I had you guys on the show. You make television, and I'd like you to make a funny uh -huh. hijacking thing. <laughs> I don't remember this episode, but... Uh, that's not weird, I guess. Well, there are 200 episodes of the A-Team. What's your favorite A-Team episode of all time? Is there one that oh, stands I don't out know. for you? I mean, I love it when they help the Amish. There's so many good ones. Why? <laughs> Why did the Amish show up as a plot device in so many hour-long action shows? I don't shows? know. The Amish refused to help themselves. Yeah. But the A-Team stood up. I can't remember what it... I don't even know if it was the Amish or it was the Amish-esque. When I was in a... I don't know how familiar you people are with the Amish. Which is a phrase I find myself saying far too much. Yeah. But they have a thing called Rumspringa, where when you're 18, I think you can be not Amish for a year and just do whatever you want. Like, go yeah, yeah. nuts. That and document, Devil's Playground? Is yes, that, is that, yes. It's pretty fascinating. It's crazy. And so when I was in a band in the 90s, we would play... Uh, you just tell the story so you can talk about your band. Anyway, <laughs> I was Kip Winger for four years. And... Uh, <laughs> But um, we would play like in, in Western Pennsylvania a lot, and there's a lot of Amish. And the first show we played there, uh, this kid who booked the show sees these kids come up, and he goes, "Oh shit!" I go, "What?" He goes, "It's a fucking Amish." And I thought he was kidding. And I'm like, "Oh, that's funny." He goes, "No, they show up on their rumspringer and they cause all kinds of problems. Like they would just show up and start fighting people and like showing their boobs and like be hammered. Like they would just be like, "We can do whatever we want for a year. I'm gonna fight everybody." <laughs> Wow. It was like a real problem. So I feel like they could have in that episode just been like, we refuse to help ourselves, but here are our berserkers. <laughs> like just have some kind of <laughs> our warrior race. <laughs> the rumspringer. <laughs> BA's like, where's your rumspringer? <laughs> we need enforcements. Get this girl drunk. <laughs> That's a pretty good erotic fan fiction I wrote about B.A. Baracus <laughs> I look forward to reading it later <laughs> also want to mention 9 o'clock Tuesday night if we could go to the next slide here is a TV movie interpretation sexy hunchback of Notre Dame <laughs> this is the hunchback of Notre Dame how long if I didn't tell you this was the hunchback of Notre Dame how long staring at this ad would it take you to figure out that this is the hunchback of Notre Dame it is <laughs> Leslie Ann Down <laughs> as like Esmeralda or whatever. Anthony Hopkins is in it. So this is like a, a huge cast. He's fresh off of The Elephant Man, which is why they were like, he can play a twisted freak. Let's have him play the hunchback. He was, I think he was nominated for an Oscar the year before this. And he's barely mentioned in this ad. It's a huge photo of a sexy gypsy. <laughs> That's their what, audience. What is she... she Spilling something on herself? I think she's trying to pour a tangerine, a tangerine, a tambourine over her head. 
Huh. Oh, yeah. I get it now. So this was... <laughs> This was a very weird made-for-TV movie where Anthony Hopkins portrays the hunchback of Notre Dame and Leslie Ann Down plays the beautiful gypsy who doesn't get a name. Uh, he loves in this production of the Victor Hugo classic directed for television. I would not have watched this, but I would have felt like I was going to get in trouble for seeing this ad. <laughs> what did you guys go with at 9 o'clock? Three's Company. Speaking of sleaze. And what did you go with, John? Is this still Tuesday? Tuesday, yeah. yeah. I have, for me, it was NHL and Deer Hunter crossed both. Oh, that's right. Eight yeah. to yeah. ten. Yeah, that's like Three's Company. Uh, did you watch Three's Company every week? I watched a lot of Three's Company. Again, I don't remember watching it as much at night as I do in the afternoon. Yeah, that was an afternoon rerun show. That was a show that was so sleazy, I always thought I was going to get in trouble for watching it. Because they would have, I don't even want to say double entendres. They were just kind of like entendres. <laughs> It was just like, I live with two chicks, I'm gonna do them. Oh! I thought you were that kind of stuff. It just didn't make any sense. And that's when it was only respectable to be gay on television if you were pretending to be gay for cheap rent. Yes. I really think it'd be really funny if some right wing conservative guy, you know, maybe a former TV star is now a political commentator, would go on the air and be like, there's all kinds of people pretending to be gay to pay cheap rent. We need to put a stop to it. <laughs> I've seen the documentary, <laughs> Three's Company. <laughs> Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, what'd you go with? Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. This is a tough night. There's a very special one-hour Facts of Life, I should mention. Oh, yeah, I might have gone with it. I went with something that started at 7, but it ended at 8.30, so I thought that counted. And I just oh, went yeah. with it because it, the name... Celebrity Comedy Fashion Show. <laughs> That's the name of it. Yeah. What is it? Oh, it's a Celebrity Comedy Fashion Show. Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. No, should we, should Do we need something? A more, like a more exciting name, <laughs> right? Nope. It's like a store brand variety show. <laughs> celebrity, and I feel like so this, I've read the description. This description is great. Is yeah. models, they're leading with models, and a raft of stars romp through the melodramatic spoof of the fashion industry. Among the cast, Jane Fonda, David Steinberg, Chevy Chase, and Morgan Fairchild. There's no way I don't want to watch what, this right now. What was now. PRV? PRV was called Preview, and it was a, a, an early pay TV station that not everybody got. It was, um, there was Cinemax, there was HBO, but Preview was sort of the Northeast's version of, uh, of, our, of those pay channels, and it was only on after 7 p.m. Oh, okay. Now, let uh, me ask this very quickly. I'm trying to remember. What, how some of the icons are black and some are white. Is that VHF, UHF? Uh, no. Uh, not always. So it was the networks or non-networks. Uh -huh. So okay, yes, occasionally by happenstance it would end up being UHF, non-UHF, but it was networks versus non-networks. So Got white it. were non-networks. Well, I put pick for 8 o'clock, I realize now, uh, Fall Guy. Fall Guy. Let's go to the next slide. This is a wow. fantastic episode of Fall Guy. <laughs> Colts out to rescue a beautiful younger... Oh, to rescue beautiful young girls, plural, from a master of mind control. There is no way in hell this fall guy would not have been watched. Do you remember how big mind control and brainwashing was in the 80s? It never comes up now. No, but I do know that the best people to deal with them are stuntmen. Absolutely, absolutely. The Unknown Stuntman. This is one of the best episodes of Fall Guy because it stars uh, John Vernon, speaking of um, Animal House, who is such a wonderful villain and is also my favorite character in Killer Clowns from Outer Space, uh, whose line is, Killer Clowns, holy shit. <laughs> um, yeah, John Vernon. And he also, his henchman is played by Wings Hauser who was sort of like the American store brand version of Rucker Hauer. And his character is named Baba. And one of the beautiful young girls, who's played by Heather Locklear, is Paige Connolly. But her co-star, Jenny, her character name is Saren Dip. <laughs> I have to save Saren Dip from this mind control master. A wealthy industrialist and Howie. It was always weird that he was a character named Howie. That seems like not a good main character name. As Howie? Was yeah. the name of the fall guy? I think no. so, yeah. Oh. 
uh, to free his daughter from a bogus religious cult before she signs away her inheritance, as opposed to those legitimate religious cults. <laughs> this one's Wait, one of the, one of the his bogus His own ones. daughter? Yeah. She can't... A wealthy industrialist <laughs> hires them. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Cult was Lee Majors. Howie was his... his uh... Wait, you can't sign away... Never mind. <laughs> It sounds fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I, I would have watched that. Normally, I would have watched the one-hour Facts of Life, which was the graduation special. Uh, but at 8.30, Square Pegs was on, which was a show that really everyone should watch now. It's a fantastic show. I love Square Pegs so much. Did you ever watch that show at the time? Square Peg? Yeah. No. It was Sarah Jessica Parker's first show. It was a bit like Square Freaks Pegs, Square Pegs. Was Square Pegs. Pegs. Yeah, the waitresses did the uh, theme song. Devo was wow. on the show. It was created by uh, Ann Beats, who was an SNL writer. Uh, was her the first, actually the first SNL writer to have their own sitcom post SNL. And it was only one season, and it was a really, really good show. It was like one of the first single camera dramedies, uh, half hour dramedies. Great show. Uh, nine o'clock. Would you go with? Nine o'clock on uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yep. Uh, John. I went with uh, North American Soccer League, Cosmos at Strikers. Did you watch soccer at this time? Yeah. Who, who would you be rooting for, the, the Cosmos or the Strikers? Well, at the time, Detroit had, uh, where I'm from, uh, yep. suburbs, <laughs> yep. Detroit Express. But, you know, I like watching soccer. Their name was the Detroit Express? Yeah, and it was like a car. There was like orange, white, and blue as their color scheme, and their, it was like a car. It was, it was like a car up on its back wheels. Like, I'm gonna get you. Yeah, it was really pretty lame. Car right? ready to fight. Yeah. It was like a, yeah, it was like a dog up on his, or a, or a, a werewolf up This on car's been orange. backed into a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Can't drive away. The Detroit Express, but I like, yeah, I watched, if sports were on, I was probably watching. Did you go to a lot of live sporting events? Mm-hmm. What was the best one you ever saw at this time? Wow, best one I ever saw? Was it in Greek town? <laughs> <laughs> there was yeah there was a Greek town just had its own thing its own thriving culture there's a little stadium in Greek that's yeah. a section of Detroit it's like Chinatown yeah. but yeah. for Greeks <laughs> and they don't a lot of sporting events yeah there's like an arena in Greek town isn't there I, I mean it's all downtown Detroit Greek yeah. town is a section of downtown you get some good uh, Coney dogs I don't know if that's such yeah. a thing out here in Boston they set a lot of things on fire there like yeah, food yeah. Up, uh, mm -hmm. that's a sport right <laughs> yeah yeah, I like Greek Town. Uh, you can think about it. You don't have to answer right now if you need I'll to think, I'll think about it. Uh, but nine o'clock, you went with that, and then Eugene, did you say? I what went you? with the one hour facts of life. This is a very special. This is the season finale of this season. It's when Jer, uh, Jer, uh, Blair, and Joe graduate. And here's an amazing thing about this episode because Joe's graduating. We have a guest appearance by Alex Rocco, Boston's own Alex Rocco, playing her dad, who was in the Italian Mafia and had to move to California because he started the Irish-Italian Mafia Wars here in Boston by hitting on a Mafia Don's girlfriend and had to get out of town quick, so they enrolled him in Leonard Nimoy's acting class, and he became an actor. But, but then, it, wasn't it easy to find him? You would think so. Um, you know, he's acting in things. Is he still alive? He is still alive. Yeah. Then it was not easy to find him. It was him. not easy. He played Mo Green in The Godfather. You may remember him. But uh, they would cast him as people from Brooklyn because Hollywood didn't know accents. So it'd be like, oh, geez, Joe, you're graduating high school. That's uh, it's really good here. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go back to Brooklyn uh, in my car. I love you, kid. Uh, it would be that kind of thing. It made no sense. Normally I would have watched that, but I was intrigued by a thing in here. There's a thing called nonfiction documentary. <laughs> That's what the title is. And it says, some of the children of darkness profiled in this report are mentally ill or emotionally disturbed young people living in institutions. That's the whole description. <laughs> I feel like that would be a comedic reality show now <laughs> on VH1 <laughs> called Children of Darkness. <laughs> So we got two more nights left here. Let's go uh, Thursday night, 8 o'clock. But before we do that, if we can go to the next slide, I just want to point out that at this time, uh, <laughs> Vincent Price would have advertised anything. So <laughs> Thursday night, 8 o'clock, what'd you go with? Oh. Um, this was a good night. This was a real good night. Yeah, I, of course, I went NHL playoffs. We're still on, so we're in the thick of the playoffs. And then I went with... Um, 
when I'm flipping channels between commercials, I went uh, Fame. Yep. The TV mm-hmm. show. TV show. Had you seen the movie by then? Uh, I, I don't know if I had seen the movie yet, um, but we watched that a lot, Fame. Fame. Did yeah. you want to go to the high school for the performing arts? I thought it'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> what would your audition song have been? What's that? What would your audition song have been at this time? I don't know. Maybe I would have done like a Leroy dance. I think you could do a Leroy dance. Yeah. You know, John, I think if you had applied yourself, you, they would have let you in. I think you could have done it. <laughs> uh, this episode, a ballet teacher played by Hollywood dance veteran Marge Champion is, uh, the TV guide said that, not me, is suspected <laughs> of racism. It's about a racist ballerina, which already I'm on board with this. And Bruno is jealous of a new music student, a prodigy who's as good on the piano as he is. We've all been there. Mm-hmm. Um, what'd you go with, Eugene? It's hard to say. You know, because Magnum P.I.'s on, yes. but so is Smokey and the Bandit. I'll give you a little bit of uh, information that might help with the choice. Magnum uh-huh. P.I. is a rerun. Ooh. Then, yeah, then I would probably just watch the movie Smokey I'd and the seen, Bandit. Smokey and the Bandit. What a, what, a, what a Sophie's choice of mustaches. I know. I know. I bet that night... Sash's choice. Sash's choice. I'll also say Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yes. That was something I did enjoy. I feel like we watched that a lot. This is hosted by Jack Palance, and this is the season that he made them hire his daughter, Holly, to also co-host with him. (laughs) Really? Who was real bubbly, and he was like, there's a race of people who have no heads in Uganda. (laughs) Believe it or not. And she was like, look at these kittens. It was like a a really weird season of the show to compete with real people. And that's incredible. They were trying to really lighten it up, which did not work. Um, But uh, I wonder if there was anyone that night who tuned in thinking they were watching Magnum, but ended up watching Smokey and the Bandit all night. Because they confused Burt Reynolds and Tom Selleck. And they're like, this is a really long episode of Magnum. Where's his tiger's hat? <laughs> what the hell? Did he put it away for this one episode? Yeah. Is he undercover? Uh, next slide here. I just want to show you uh, something. There's Jack Palance and Holly Palance on the top there. Uh, and there was a show on at 930 called Amanda's. Do you guys know what that show is? No, but I got pretty excited uh, when I saw it. I've never heard of it. I'll tell you what it is. Did you pick that for... Uh, would you pick for nine? And then we'll do it at 930. You no, know, I might have actually... So uh, I think I might have actually... Uh, God, where was it? Well, there was Give Me a Break at 9, and then a yes. message maybe. A, oh, Simon and Simon also. Oh. I mean, those guys really know how to solve, solve crimes. They get in trouble. I don't know. Do you, there's no one I know that I would trust solving a crime with their sibling. I can't think of anyone I know who I'd be like, I would hire you both as detectives. <laughs> None of them. Like, even if they were good detectives individually, I would be like, together you guys will mess this up. There's no way. I will pay Not more. Simon and Simon. No, they I mean, they get into trouble. Don't get me wrong. Well, I think the key was one of them had a cowboy hat and one of them didn't. Is that, they I, both I, had mustaches? They both had mustaches. They were brothers? They were brothers. I remember watching the episode. Yeah. They, they, they had you, the same first names. Yeah. yeah. Their names Simon, yeah, Simon Jones and Simon Smith. Uh, they never found out who their real mother was. Um, Can I point something out true? really quick that I'm no. noticing? Like, is Jack Palance, is it Palance or Palance? I call him Palance, but he would probably say Palance. I feel like his name is in uh, bolder face type. Yeah, it is. He goes, I'll hire my daughter if I get top billing. <laughs> Make sure I'm in bold face. <laughs> and I like how he's trying to smile in this photo, but it doesn't work. He looks terrifying. He's like, yeah, I know I sound like Brandon Tartikoff, so what? <laughs> <laughs> the whole time it was me, everybody. Brandon Tartikoff does not exist. He's Kaiser Sozi. I am Brenda Dardo. <laughs> I want to hear about Amanda. So Amanda, so did you pick that for 9.30? Um, uh, it is, yeah. It was on against Cheers, but Amanda's was the U.S. remake of Faulty Towers. It was the first attempt to make Faulty Towers in the U.S. And B. Arthur, or Beatrice America's Arthur. America's John Cleese. America's John Cleese. <laughs> You know, I think you could very easily Photoshop that into John Cleese. I think with just a slight tweak of the hair, it looks pretty much exactly like John Cleese. Here's how you can tell them apart. B. Arthur's slightly taller. Yeah. Um, so they basically remade Faulty Towers, and she was the Bazzi Faulty character, and it was awful. And then they tried to remake it again, and they said the problem here is the Basil Faulty character. So they remade the show without that character and just made it about the hotel. 
Was it that John Cleese didn't want to do it? They didn't even offer it to him. They would not hire a UK person to remake a US show because there was a long history at this point, like, oh, and the family's a remake of a UK show as it's Sanford and Son and a bunch of those shows. Uh, they tried to do a, UK re- a US remake of The Young Ones and the only person that they hired was Nigel Planer. <laughs> The least, although I like him, the least charismatic person on that cast, they, were, they just didn't get it right. Tartikoff, he screwed this one up, even though he didn't work for ABC. He, he could make Miami Vice, but he couldn't make Amanda's. He just wrote down, <laughs> Faulty Towers with B. Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was not a great show, and it was very, very short-lived. Uh, it uh, was a huge bomb. New day and time as well. They moved the time about seven times. So the final night of the week, Friday night, school's Mm. over, you're running right home, you can stay up all night if you want, watch whatever sports you want, which I assume you may have done. Not a lot of sports on this night that I would have watched. It's Friday night, not a... You wouldn't watch track and field? (laughs) Probably not. Listen, I did not write any sports down. Really? Mm -hmm. Was, Was there a sport that you drew the line at? Like, you're like, I'll watch any sport except bowling. I don't think so. Really? Did you ever watch bowling? Sure. Did you always have to pick someone to root for, or were you just like, I don't care? I don't know if I'd watch the whole thing. I just would just kind of put stuff on, but there was mostly like football and baseball and basketball and hockey. Did you have a different team from anyone in your family, so there was like a rivalry? No. Like, so there was no team that was your Battlestar Galactica? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not within the family, although I do remember once what, something I did. It was Detroit, and in Chicago, actually, the Pistons and the Bulls had a heated rivalry at the time and we had WGN yeah on our Superstation cable. GN from Chicago mm-hmm. and I'm watching uh, I think I was watching a game and it was on G- WGN and then it goes right to the newscast and one of the newscasters or sportscasters starts just disparaging the players on the Pistons and I was just like I was so livid that I'm these Chicago find newscasters are talking shit about the Detroit sports uh, the, 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 t- the players in the Pistons and I called information and I asked God the number of WGN. You called W? How old were you? I must have been early high school. It was, oh, wait a minute. Uh, now I got 31. I, I almost don't want to know. Yeah. Let's but say think, 14. I was, I was high school or college maybe because but, but, it was in a house it was in the house that my mom and stepdad bought my senior year of high school. Okay, so, so this maybe is, it was around then. So you so could have been topless too, on too TV old. and have it be legal. That's how old you were. <laughs> maybe too old to make this phone call and get this upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did call and I got some probably an operator. You, your newscaster shouldn't be talking like this about Detroit athletes. <laughs> what did she say? Was she like, sorry? All right, uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll report it. <laughs> couldn't have given a shit less probably thought it was a prank it'd be funny if you're watching it live and they wa- like interrupt the news and they're like get off now we're getting complaints get her off the air <laughs> so Eugene, we'll start with Eugene we got the tease that John did not go with a sporting event but where did you go 8 o'clock on Friday 8 o'clock on Friday uh, I went with Dukes of Hazard. The Dukes. Dukes, the good old boys. This they is, never meant no harm. They didn't. You know they didn't. This is a repeat, so I would not Always. have gone with it. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. I'd probably watch the repeat uh, unless, uh, oh, but, but, but Beloved Infidel is on. I don't know. It's, Beloved Infidel, it's a movie about hijacking. It's not. I don't know what that is. I think I would. Here's the interesting thing about watch. the Dukes that night. It's the episode that's about Sadie Hog Day, which sounds filthy. <laughs> When the ladies run Hazard County, Hogg installs Daisy as the treasurer to frame her for embezzlement. A woman as a treasurer? It would have to be something crazy like Sadie Hogg Day. (laughs) There was a real difficult choice here for me because there's a Bernstein Bears special on. The Bernstein Bears Littlest Leaguer, which is a sports thing, about as sportsy as I'll get. Sure. Against the television debut of The Shining. Both feature bears. <laughs> what did you go with, John? I went with Meatballs. It was also on. Yes. That's an HBO classic, Meatballs. Yeah. I have a controversial opinion. Meatballs 2 is the better movie. Wow. Yep. Wow. It's got an alien. It's got Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> it's got an alien? Yeah, named Meathead. 
John no. Larroquette's in it? I don't even know if I knew Whoa. that was another meeting. Four-time Emmy Award-winning actor John Larroquette. Yes. John Larroquette, who won so many Emmys for Night Court, he had to ask them to stop nominating him. Yeah. He's an upstanding guy. I hope to will do that one day. Yes. I think... Please, I think, please, enough. You're sort of the John Larroquette of our time. <laughs> Tell that to the remake of Night Court. Yep. <laughs> I would, I would like to see a remake of Meatballs 2. Not the first one, just Meatballs 2. <laughs> the next generation. Uh, so you're watching that all night. Yeah, Meatballs was my across the board, but I'd go Dukes of Hazard if I was watching something else. Uh, that's between eight and nine. Did nine you ever go to summer camp? Oh yeah, camp was a major part of my life. Major part of my life. <laughs> like, were you like, is Meatballs is not accurate? Oh, I love Meatballs. Did you think it was an accurate mm-hmm. representation of summer camp life? Felt pretty good. What, is, what was the most accurate representation of summer camp life, movie-wise, for something you've seen? Please don't say Friday the 13th. <laughs> what, you mean in general? Yeah, like, what was a movie? If you're, like, feeling nostalgic for your time and summer camp, you'll, like, throw a movie on and be like, it's just like Little Darlings. I don't know if I ever, ever have those moments in life. <laughs> so you don't oh, say, I'm feeling camp. nostalgic for camp. I got to put something on. <laughs> Sometimes. I forget not everyone suffers from the same mental illness that I do. <laughs> Other than I can like tell meatballs and wet hot American stuff, how many? Oh, there's a lot of summer I camp movies. I mean, I'm movies. sure there are. Madman, Sleepaway Camp series, Summer Camp Nightmare, uh, Little Darlings, where two. So none of the things you're naming are movies anyone knows about. Po- the made-for-TV movie Poison Ivy with Mary Jo Palmacek. Again, never no. <laughs> Michael J. Fox. If you had said Space Camp, we'd be like, okay, but we never went to space. Space Camp. Oh, it was Space Camp, right? That's what you forgot to mention. You yeah, went yeah. to Space Camp every year. Yeah. That's why I, didn't I will say to- that in sixth grade, I called my counselor a fucking cocksucker. <laughs> really. Yeah. What did he do? Did he disparage the, Detro- the Detroit Pistons? <laughs> we were, uh, our... <laughs> yeah, and I lost my, sh- I lost my mind. <laughs> He's like, those Pistons, they're just not that good. <laughs> Excuse me? You fucking cocksucker! Go in your cabin, I'm gonna call you in one minute. <laughs> I did it thinking I was being funny. I got a joke, everybody. Say knock knock. Counselor's a fucking cocksucker. Can I have extra s'mores? <laughs> Did he think it was funny? Oh, oh no. <laughs> what was your What was your punishment? Uh, he just, just sent me back to the bunk. Back to the bunk, yep. and you'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Back, just chewed me out in front of everybody. We were playing softball. We were playing another bunk, and we were really beating him bad. And he did one of the things of you know trying to be a good guy and let the other bunk get back in the game, pretended to lose a fly ball in the air in the, in the sun and just, oh, I can't, I can't see it, I dropped it off. He threw the, the game. He was, well, it wasn't even close. They were not going to come back and win. So me thinking I'm being hilarious, I went, oh, come on, Mark. I knew he was being jokey and I thought yeah. me being jokey, I went, oh man, Mark, you fucking cocksucker. <laughs> and I thought for sure this is going to crack everybody up. Like he'd run over and high five well, you. Did it crack everybody but Mark up? I don't think so. I think he just was like, back to the bunk now. <laughs> and I was just shocked. and like, oh, I, was still trying. I thought I was being funny. I just, <laughs> this is not like Ernest Goes to Camp. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it was rough. That's why you probably shouldn't have been watching On Demand. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that on TV? Is that where you got that language from? I don't even know. God, I just thought swearing was cool and funny. So he heard Reagan say it. Yeah, Reagan did his famous cocksucker address, uh, <laughs> 1986. <laughs> so Eugene, what are you going with at nine o'clock? From nine at nine o'clock, there's only one real choice. There really is only one choice. And it is Night Rider. It is absolutely Night Rider. Uh, number one, I would like to see someone do a funny or die video called Night Rider Court. That's just um, traffic court where Kit is the judge. Um, <laughs> When you get to L.A., let them know. It I will help you. I will let them know that. Uh, I love David Hasselhoff. I will, there's nothing I won't watch him in, up to and including Baywatch Nights, where he plays a detective lifeguard who fights monsters. <laughs> Is that true? That's true. Wait, that, are there monsters in Baywatch? Yes. So here's what happened. Baywatch is about lifeguards. Sure. He was like, I want to also be a detective. And Baywatch was so popular, they made Baywatch Nights, where it was like he was a lifeguard by day, detective by night. Season one, no one watched. They go... How are we going to do season two? You know what's pretty popular right now? The X-Files. He now fights monsters. 
So it was about a supernatural detective played by David Hasselhoff playing Mitch. Not a different character, he's also Mitch. Who fights monsters at night. And my favorite episode, the one I always cite as the most ridiculous one, was literally an unfrozen caveman on a rampage. <laughs> like a malicious Encino man. How many seasons? Two. Of with the monsters? One. Oh. Did so not so help. I can only watch 20 of these excellent Yes, things. it's only available on DVD in Germany. Really? Yeah, that's true. Or I can hook you up as well. Is it subtitled? It or is subtitled. Or you guess at the... It's subtitled, it's subtitled in German. Oh, right, but otherwise in English. Yeah, which adds to the atmosphere. Now I'm like, they shot it only in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be great if it was subtitled in German already. Like, they're like, like Hasselhoff's like, all right fight monsters, and I think to add to the atmosphere, the subtitle is show in German. Uh, but this episode, after Michael unintentionally kills a cycle gang member, Jesus. which you never saw people actually die on these shows, that's a very big deal, uh, a cycle gang member, the only witness, insists that he'll recover her kidnapped child before she'll help him. He's being blackmailed, there's a character named Tiny, Played by Dennis Burke. Oh, a Berkley. cycle gang. Yeah, I cycle you said gang. Psycho gang. Well, they could like, be that gang too. Sounds scary. Psycho gang sounds real scary. Do you know what the what the gang was called? Uh, Robin Curtis. No, the Robin Curtises. The Satan Stompers. <laughs> cycle meaning motor or bicycle? Yes. Satan. Well, it could be bicycle. Cycle. In a sense, would normally mean bicycle. And it'd be funny if he accidentally murdered him because he was like, I didn't mean to beat him to death. <laughs> like, he just gets in a traffic altercation with like a bike messenger and just starts punching him in the head. Hasselhoff would do that. I punched a bike messenger once. Did you call him a fucking cocksucker? Did he disparage the Detroit Pistons? <laughs> I think I uh, called no. him a fucking pussy. Nice. After you punched him? Yeah, because he rode away and was like, and I just snapped. What did he do? Did he deliver you a message that you didn't like? And he's he, like, literally, don't punch the messenger. He was coming through a red light, and, I, and I've had that fantasy so many times. These just guys that just don't give a shit, yeah. bike through red lights, almost hit people, and for whatever reason, it was not today. <laughs> <laughs> did anyone witness it and then try to blackmail you into helping find their kidnapped child? Here, here's what happened. I'll keep this short, because I think we're almost done. Yeah, we're this almost pretty done. good. I, I just come back from a run. I'm waiting across the light. I now have the right of way. I start to step out, I look, and I see these two guys flying. So I could have just stepped back and let them go, but yeah, again, not today. Yeah, pick the wrong First day. guy goes through, the second guy, and it wasn't a punch, I kind of clotheslined him. Oh! Back. Yeah, fucking let oh. him have it, because he deserved it. I he was, he made this. no, no, it was not stopping, and he was going hard through this red light. 100% in the wrong, and so was I, but whatever. But I feel, I, but it, 200s listen, make a 200. If he, if I had knocked him down and he had, fell and hit his head and died. I was already playing that in my head. I'm like, all right, if I'm in court and he died, your honor, I was defending myself and in the act of defending myself, he fell over and made the two mistakes, the, the two poor choices to run a red light. No helmet. And no helmet. What can I do? I Sorry, don't think anyone. There's no but he didn't fall? No, he kind of like knocked off balance and then kept going and like gave me the finger and kept going. I'm kind of impressed that he was able to take a full on punch and didn't fall off a bike. That would have been on That's Incredible Now. <laughs> Um, I will say this to wrap up. I understand why you and Eugene are friends because you're essentially a one-man A-team. <laughs> you had a BA day. Yeah. And I'm, of course, a combination of Dirk Benedict and uh, Mad Murdoch. It's true. Eugene See, never flew here. Show, so I'll just say, I guess yeah. that's a compliment. And it'd, be, it'd be funny if someone uh, was in court and they are like, Your Honor, I was having a BA day. It stands for bad attitude anyway. Not guilty? See ya. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yeah, you can do that. That'll stand yeah. up. I'm not a lawyer. That's really what BA stood for? Bad, Bad attitude. attitude. All right. yep. Dirk, face man, Dirk Benedict, he was a swindler. Handsome yep. swindler. I marry rich ladies. They die. I get their money. I'm the main character of this TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for doing the show. We are out of time, and thank you guys for coming. Thanks for the Thanks. show. So much fun. Thank you. Thank you.
started, as promised, John Glazer, Eugene Merman, really fun show. I really enjoyed doing it, and it was great to see so many people coming out to the show. That's always surprising to me. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and you'll listen to the show again. Make sure you subscribe, because we do a new episode every Wednesday, but I have these sort of off-cycle episodes. If there's live or a special, you never know. So make sure you subscribe, and if you like the show, rate and review the show on iTunes. It's a huge help. You can also sign up for our mailing list at tvguidancecounselor.com. I will not spam you. I think I've sent out one email uh, thus far actually announcing this very show that you just listened to. I am doing another live show at the Bridgetown Comedy Festival in Portland, Oregon on Sunday, May 10th in the afternoon. Uh, you can go to bridgetowncomedy.com. My guest will be Brendan Small, so that'll be a lot of fun. you got a couple weeks to get there and uh, get to the show. Start walking. It'll be a good time. Uh, but I'll probably send an email out about that show. You can also email me at tvguidancecounselor at gmail.com or at uh, can at ICanRead.com. You can also go to our Facebook, TV Guidance Counselor, or at TV Guidance on Twitter. So we'll see you again Wednesday for an all-new episode of TV Guidance Counselor. But in the show, they never were like, by the way, the Incredible Hulk is deaf. Is this before the invention of candy or walking around? I don't know. Maybe I would have done like a Leroy dance. He's like, yeah, I know I sound like Brandon Tartikoff, so what? Oh man, Mark, you fucking cocksucker.